The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the nighttime sky sheds spongiform aliens that communicate by absorption and regurgitation. Yuck. Mass market paperbacks delightfully drive themselves to market with the stick of story and the border collie of world-building excellence. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We have part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and five members of the BU9 Honorverse Consulting Group, including Thomas Pope, Chris Weave, Mark Guttis, Stephen Ryder, and Arius Kaufman. All of them were in our studio here at Bain, and we had a great time doing this one. It's a lot of fun. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. First, here's the news. Oh, Mass Market, Mass Market, you are a fast read. Home again, take me, friend, or download an e-read. Something's off with this canchon there. This month's Mass Market paperbacks are at booksellers everywhere. They include Cauldron of Ghost, book three in the Crown of Slaves subseries within the Honorverse. That's by David Weber and Eric Flint and the conclusion of the Anton Zilwicky and Victor Kachat subseries for now. The Mason alignment is outed, but it's certainly not done in this one, and Zilwicky and Kachat return to Mesa to strike a blow against them, and lots of adventure ensues. Also out in mass market is The Chaplain's War by Brad Torgerson. This is a very cool debut novel about a chaplain caught behind enemy lines, during a devastating war between humans and mantis-like aliens. There's lots of action and some real thoughtful speculation about war and peace in this one, and it's got a, sort of a Orson Scott Card Ender's Game feel to it, if you ask me. Cauldron of Ghost and The Chaplain's War are now available at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part roundtable interview with David Weber and several top members of BU9, the Honorverse Consulting Group, talking about all things honor and beyond. Part two of the discussion will appear next time on the podcast. I want to welcome several members of BU9, the David Weber Honorverse Consulting Group, to the podcast. And David Weber himself. Hello, folks. Hi. David Weber is the creator of the internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series and the Honorverse within which that series is set. David's Honor Harrington science fiction novels have sold millions of copies over the years. David is also the author of many other novels, uh, many other Bane books, including the epic fantasy Bazel series, uh, which is also when right what are we calling this anyway the, um well i'm i'm calling them the bazel cycle and the kenhoden cycle all right the latest is the sword of the south which is the first in the kenhoden cycle yes. of, of fantasies david has had um what are we 28 new york times bestsellers now all told and there are over seven and a half million david weber books in print which may be eight at the moment corinda sent me some new numbers uh, we have Thomas Pope, who is the founder of BU9, a collection of professionals assisting David Weber in defining and documenting the Honorverse. In his first professional job for Bain, he served as the lead editor for House of Steel, the Honorverse Companion, which is a very cool book. Before founding BU9, he served as the co-designer of Ad Astra Games' Saganami Island Tactical Simulator, and as the co-author of both issues of Jane's Intelligence Review. Tom is also the co-author of new Manticore Ascendant series, Entry, A Call to Arms, along with David Weber and Timothy Zahn. Mark Guttis is a practicing attorney. Mark indexes and writes about the legal systems and governments of Honorverse within BU9, 
Chris Weave is a naval analyst working for the Department of Defense. He spent six years at the Center for Naval Analyses as a naval exercise analyst and war game designer, and five years on the faculty of the Naval War College as a war game designer and analyst. In addition to wargaming, his specialties include command and control and anti-submarine warfare. In the honorverse, he's interested in command and control and naval tactical and operational doctrine. And Tom, can you tell us who the rest of our, our B9 folks are? Well, certainly. We have two two other members. We have Arius Kaufman, who has been a member for quite a while, but he hasn't appeared on any of the podcasts before. Arius has been a, a he, was it human terrain? Was that the, the term yes, you used? Uh, he has uh, helped out with a lot of the government and the social structures of the honorverse um, throughout uh, quite a bit of B9's history. And then our newest member, Stephen Ryder, um, he's a, been a member on probation for a couple of years, working on a couple of secret black projects, and now he is now a full member of BU9, working on the you economics. You, you of let it. him out of the closet. Yes, finally. exactly. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. <laughs> when I, I say secret right black, I mean, we're just, <laughs> okay. yeah. You're just scratching um, sound on the inside <laughs> of the door. <laughs> and Stephen right now is working on the economics of the universe. What does it take to become a made man in BU9 <laughs> or a woman? <laughs> It's, um, we are a very select organization. Uh, we have, it, a lot of it is having a passion for the universe, having a specific skill set that we are looking for, that we're, that we need, someone who, who can take their real world experience and turn it into something that can, they can translate that into a science fiction society that is three, four thousand years in the future. And it's people who can take what I've done as having a concept in my own mind of how it works, but only giving a few data points to the reader because they only see it here and there. Uh, it's people who can take those data points and, and fare the graph to, to do the complete structure to explicate it for someone else. And in some cases, even for me, um, because Tom and I have spent many, many a night uh, with conversations that have He's learned to dread the words, ooh, shiny, because that means that David has just ducked down another rabbit hole and he's going to have to take lots of notes, you know. Uh, but it's been great from, from my perspective. Sounds almost symbiotic to the Libby and it, it, I think that it really has become that. Um, and I think that the, um, the collaborations with uh, Tim and Tom and, and me uh, are that and, and the companion. Are, are the clearest, clearest proof of that. I think that the novels may be even more than the companion because it's an evolving process. Um, and I have deliberately had Tim and Tom taking lead on writing those books, um, for a lot of reasons. One being that I'm so happy with what they're doing. Okay. But another one is that from the very beginning, since they're set three, four hundred years before Honor's time, it was important that they have a different feel from the books that were written honors time frame. And I think that the creators of a science, the creator of a science fiction technology actually has more trouble backing it up than somebody who comes to it from the outside would. So Tom's ability to take the technology of Honor Harrington's time and the few hard dates that I nailed down for when things happen and step it back into an earlier technology that is still fully consistent and doesn't have any, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't have any place where the, where the technology elides uh, the way that it might if I were doing it. Um, I think that's been just a huge help. Uh, reverse engineering temporarily. Yeah, yes, it really yes. is. For example, when, when, you know, Tom and I had talked about the difference between the missile capabilities and so forth in Honor's time, and then, you know, when Honor becomes an officer, then where we are at the end of the war and where we had started from all this time before, and we talked about when the laser head became available, et cetera, et cetera, yep. et cetera. He's done a really, really good job of establishing the parameters for the missile technology of Travis's time, which are hugely significantly different from Honor's time. In, in Travis's time, really and truly, you design a ship on the theory that if you get a good hit in, you're going to kill it. In Honor's time, you're designing ships on the theory that damage is survivable with good design and good damage control, even though the warheads are immensely more destructive by Honor's time. It, you've got that 
eternal race between offense and defense, which has kind of struck a balance, and then it goes off the deep end when the pod missiles come in, and now Honor and the Royal Manticore and Navy are kind of reestablishing a new doctrine and so forth that will help you survive the missile storm. But in in the time that Travis is living and the time that Tom is structuring the technology for, if you take a good solid missile hit, you're probably pretty much toast. The problem is it's really hard to get the hit in the first place. And you can't carry very many, very many missiles. So in some ways, you could almost say that the classic missile duel period of honors history is um, the, the dreadnought era with battleships going after each other. And in an odd sort of way, 300 years earlier, you're where we are, where we were in the 60s and where we are today, yeah. where you're looking at one hit kills, at least mission kills a ship. Okay? And yeah. because I let Tom really take the lead on structuring that, it has a totally different feel, I think, from the technology that honors people are handling. You can see similarities. I mean, you can see where the threads are going. He's been very good about that, too. But it's a different tech base, and which it should be. spaceship battles are, are different. It's a different feel. Yeah. Very differently and conceived. A lot of the, a lot of the way that, that came about is the, the discussions that we've had in BU9 for the last 10 years about how, you know, one of the things that really I really like about working with this group is that I don't just get the... I don't just get the science fiction fans look at something. I get the historians look at something or the physicists look or sometimes the, you know, someone who's done both of those things. And so we really tend to build out these systems. And when we have systems that have to work in a certain way in a book, um, we spend time thinking about how they came to be that way. And so Andy Presby, who's unfortunately not here today, he had this entire tech timeline that, that he built so we could have an internal document so we knew when things popped up. And I went back to look at that and tried to trace along to make mm -hmm. sure that I was doing things that matched that with Travis. And other where, conversations we've had where led is to that. this stuff? It's <laughs> all, <laughs> all yes. on my computer. <laughs> it's buried in a vault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of things we have that are you know, for internal use only that we'd love to share, but it's... Is there a database that is, has it all, or is it... Uh... Calling it a database is perhaps a little bit of a social promotion for it. Dressing yeah. it too um, finely. <laughs> we have yeah. our own internal wiki. We yeah. have... Um, that we're slowly populating with all the various files that we've put together over the years. Um, but um, it's not, it's by no means complete at this point. Um, we're in the process of sort of trying to get all that stuff together. And our long term goal is to be able to make as much of that stuff available as we can. But um, there there's some, there's some issues with that, one of which is our standards are high. The other one is, Anything we put out, we don't want to nail David's feet to the floor. See, anything that comes out from BU-9 is going to be considered to be official canon, as, yeah. as it should be. And that means that anything that they do that gets into an area that I haven't fully developed that I might want to go into with a story, any ranging marks that they put down, I'll have to honor when I get ready to write a story that goes into that time slot. I think that it's probably fair to say that there are very few science fiction authors out there today who have already shared as who have shared as much of the background on the universe as Bunine and I already have. Um, you know, mostly you don't want to let people look too deeply into that bag of tricks because they'll say, "Well, that's dumb," okay, or something. If I if I were starting the honor books today, for example, okay, instead of 25 years ago next year. Okay, some of the starting assumptions about the technology and particularly the cybernetics and so forth in the universe might be significantly different. As it is, I'm kind of stuck with what I established as this is the way that it works. And so I've done a few things, like for example, um, when I started writing the Honor Harrington books, um, I did not have a cell phone. Nobody I knew had a cell phone. Um, and so the, the, if you've noticed in some of the later books, things like the Unilink from the Stephanie Harrington books and so forth have turned up and it's kind of like, they were really there all <laughs> along. They just didn't yeah. get mentioned, you know? Um, and there's some other 
small fixes that you can do like that. But for the big tech decision points, okay. you're kind of stuck where you are. And I've been pleased with how well most of those have actually held up, to be honest. And this is a, a big challenge for us as well. And it's something that some 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 of our members have had more trouble with, with with others, all of us at different times, where we'll come up with this wonderful idea that just is a logical extension and the physics work and the math works. And we can we think, okay, let's bring this to David. And then we look back and say, but if this was true, Something else, something that the books have said wouldn't happen. And so it, it's something, it is, it is self-evidently false, even though it's a really good idea. And, or, and, or, this is the laws of physics. And so a lot of our job, um, and across everything, across the legal system, across the political system, across the economic system, and of course the technology, is looking at what we've built and seeing, if this works this way, can it support the books as written? And if it can't, we have to throw it out. Because it is, it is, you know, by definition, think, it is wrong. I think and, there have been maybe a couple of points that have come up where there's a way to kind of squeegee it in. Yes. But, yes. but you, you have to be very careful when you do that. That, let's put it this way, you can get away with something that could be a bit ambiguous if this were the like case. Like the Unilink or something like yes, that. Yes. You can't get away with something that would flatly, well, if they were doing that now, then 20 years later, they would obviously have to be doing this. Yep. Okay, you just, you, you can't, you can't do that. But there is, um, to, that's why I want to start a new series. But we, <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> to attract people of quality that are in BU9, there had to be some kernel there that was pretty damn um, impressive to start with, right? I mean, what drew you guys in? I can leave um, the room if you want. <laughs> well, do, do you want do you want the history of the founding of BU9? It would be yeah, sure. How about okay. origins? Um, yeah. Do you want me to do this, Tom? Yeah, go yeah, for it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in the beginning, in the beginning, <laughs> after Honor Harrington came out, gather around the fire. Gather around the fire. So was, the darkness was, moved upon the face of the waters. <laughs> yes. Okay. So in the beginning, there was Ad Astra's. Uh, Saganami Island Tactical Simulator, which uh, was done by Ken Birdside and Tom Pope. And because um, uh, Ken has an amazing ability to Shanghai people into being his co-author and stuff. You have a conversation with Ken, and next thing you know, you've agreed to devote the next five years of your life to him. Um, and that's what happened with Tom. <laughs> and so this was, it had some interesting background stuff in it, and it was something that sort of pulled people together. And a lot of people started contacting Ken about the game, and they were interested in the background stuff that went with the game. And Ken kept that list of people, and Tom got access to that list of people, and then we all sort of ended up starting to talk with each other, uh, like we met at cons and things like that. I first met Tom and David literally at the same time, uh, at PhilCon in 2005. And over time, that group sort of spent some time talking to each other, etc. Then there was the first attempt to make the Honor Harrington movie. And the person who had the rights at that point was interested in talking to people that knew about naval stuff. And so Tom was able to reach into his list of people that knew about naval stuff that included me and some others. And that, at that point, we really sort of turned into a mailing list. Then came the idea of doing the Honorverse Companion. Now, the idea of the Companion goes back to, I believe, the, the foundation of the Honorverse mm -hmm. when uh, David was talking with Jim and, and uh, Tony Weisskopf about doing the series. Um, but 20 years later, it became time. It was going to be the 20th anniversary. Tony well, says, somebody, we need to do a companion. And David said, I know the guys. What, what went back to the, the founding of this was my original tech Bible, which yeah. has seen much revision over the years. But a lot of it's held up, too. Mm -hmm. um, but by this time, uh, we'd actually had, uh, I think, well before this happened, we'd had the first of what we considered to be honor cons. Yes. Where yes. BU9 would gather, like we did Norfolk, I think, was the first one. Yep. Um, and then, uh, you know, like two or three, four times, you guys have been down to South Carolina and we, you know, move into a hotel for a weekend and we do it, you know, kind of thing. And I told them that they needed to incorporate and talk to Jim, uh, to, uh, actually to Tony, about doing the companion. Um, because I felt like this was absolutely the, 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 the only people who could do it. I already knew and trusted all of them. 
Uh, they'd spent years um, talking about the material, and, and I was comfortable with them. If they needed to ask me a question, I felt, first of all, that it would be, um, it would be a good question. And secondly, that if I told them, you know what, I'm sorry, that's not going to work, none of them are going to say, well, my feelings are hurt you know, go away, um, that, that, that we had a working relationship, I guess is what I'm trying to I remember when Jim Bain bought like, I think, five novels from me in the space of like a year and a half before the first one came out, okay? And I had a conversation with Tony uh, Weisskopf, um, and I said uh, something, I can't remember what I said, but I said, I guess, you know, when one of these comes out, I'll, I'll really be a professional novelist. And she said, David, as far as we're concerned, you already are because of the, you know, the, the quality of your work and your work ethic. Okay. And that's really the way that I felt about these guys. Um, and so there was, like I say, there was never any question in my mind about who I wanted to do the companion. The, what turned out to be a problem was there was no way we were going to get the companion into one set of covers. Um, and that's partly the fault of the, Okay. There was that guy who was going to write a short story. <laughs> I think it was going to be the front part of the companion, and, it, and he was allocated 30,000 words and then ended up writing 90. Um, what, was, what was that guy's name? Tom, do you remember that guy's name? I don't know. I remember him calling me at work saying, I'm, on, I'm word 65,000 of my 30,000 word limits. <laughs> Okay, but guys, guys, okay. In all honesty, even if you'd had another 60,000 words, you couldn't have got the entire honor no. under one. No, we, no this is very covered. true. We couldn't. When we first scoped it out, we were, we were thinking that we probably had like 250 or 300,000 words because at that point it was going to be all the powers of the honorverse. It was going to be the honorverse companion. And we were looking at 300,000 words. You fools, you fools. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and then Tony Weisskopf told us 100,000 words tops. Um, of which David's going to get 30,000. And at that point, it's like, all right, you know, this is what we got. We got to do it. And um, so then David proceeded to use like 90,000 or 100,000 <laughs> words. <laughs> well, I, I called I call Tony and I said, Tony, there's no way we're going to get this done in, in one book. Um, and so my thought is, and this was even before we had started doing the, the Yeah, we, the we rescoped it twice. All. Yeah. Um, and I said to her, I said, okay, there are two things to look at here. One is for the folks who really, 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 really are interested in the nuts and the bolts of the universe, this is going to be manna from heaven. They're going to really, really want this. For the people who aren't really, really, really into the nuts and bolts of it, they're kind of going to go, eh, well, it would be kind of cool. But so the idea here was that we would offer to the folks who are really into the nuts and bolts, here they are. And to the other folks, the folks who read the Honorverse because they really like the Honorverse, but they're not techno weenies or, or whatever, we give them a novella in the front that will cover a part of the history of the Honorverse that has never appeared in any of the novels and that will tie into the material in the back. There will be a direct relationship between it. And it, it frankly makes it into a, a not a small press Thing, but something that that can go in bookstores and yeah. A, yeah, yeah, and and I th I think it, I think it worked well actually. Um, I'm yeah, I I'm, I'm very satisfied with the with the the technical data and stuff in there, um, and I think that the story worked as well. Um, there is one guy on my website who shall remain nameless, but you know who you are. Um, <laughs> who I have had words with upon occasion because he says, oh, they didn't proofread it properly. They blew it. They did this. They did that. They did the other. And I have told him repeatedly that any place it departs from what he perceives as canon, they checked with me first, okay? Um, but there are, there are some people, and you got to love them as a writer because of the depth and the intensity of their investment in what you do, okay? But... They're the kind, uh, what was the, the, the movie, uh, that said at the site, the, 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 the 
the fans of the TV series. They come and grab the crew. From Galaxy Quest. Galaxy yeah. Quest. Okay, I mean, it's like the guy who comes up to you and says, no, he was the red shirt who died on on page 15 of the script from the 13th episode, you know. And pretty of. much every member of Bu 9 is that guy. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we, but, we are. <laughs> but, but you kind of, you also have a life, okay? I mean, yeah. Do, do you guys remember the, the, the guy who was arguing with me at the con about, you know, how naval warfare doesn't work that way? And he, he was, I think he was, he was, he was from Europe and he was explaining to me that, no, this is not how it works, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm oh, like, at Demicon. Yeah. Yes. Remember the guy yes, I do. About? I think I do. Yes, I, I do. Yeah. Yep. And he, and he was wrong anyway. Okay. <laughs> from what, from the, his basic premises, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like the guy who told me, well, the Royal Manticoran Navy wouldn't do that. Why not? Because the Royal British Navy didn't do it. And I'm like, excuse me? You know, have you actually looked at the internal dynamics of the Royal Manticoran Navy? It's actually a lot more similar to the U.S. Navy than it is to the Royal Navy to begin with. And secondly, it's my Navy. <laughs> it will do what I tell it to do. <laughs> and we departed from uh, this is this is England in space after... Yeah. Um, after uh, Haven, well, I deliberately, I I deliberately turned Haven into the 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 Revolutionary Republic as far as the readers thought to keep them looking for Napoleon rather than having Cincinnatus coming out of the woodwork on them later on. Uh, I mean, you know, it's like, and everybody thought, well, this is France, and then they found out, well, except for the fact that there's not a vice president, this constitution sounds an awful lot like one we know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I deliberately left the vice president out because I'm thinking about a pot potential political crisis in the not too distant future. I may not do it to them, but that's why I left it out in the first <laughs> place, so that I could if I needed to. Well, what is um? So B9 is incorporated now. Yes, yeah, yeah, we we have been since before House of Steel. Yeah, we in, we incorporated because um, Tony Weisskopf, I guess, was having a little bit of trouble wrapping her head around the idea of a contract with a mailing list. Um, and so it was easier for us to incorporate, and then it, it just makes things easier all around if we incorporated. So we so we had, went ahead and incor incorporated. So we were doing these honor con get-togethers. That's what we called it when we would all get together. We were doing those for a few years before we actually started calling ourselves BU9. Um, we only started calling ourselves BU9 when the companion came around, and we really sort of we needed we needed to have a name to incorporate under, um, and a bunch of guys was already taken. And um, nine comes from. It came from the original name was O and I Tech Team Nine. Uh, that was that was our original our original designate, and that was because there were nine original members of of the group. And I think there was the first uh, HonorCon one or two. I think we had the the nine, and then David recommended Bu Nine because it was a bureau that. Didn't exist in the Manticoran Navy, but could have, as as they the had few ships. And yes, exactly. Yep. And the funny thing is, we always tell people that there were nine original members, but we've never been able to actually write down a list from any nine time rings period. for mortal <laughs> men. Wait, okay. We've, we've never been able to write down a list of nine names at any given time. We yeah. can get the seven, we can get the eight, we can get the ten, but there was because people didn't join singly. They sometimes they joined in in groups. Groups, we don't actually have a list of what, yeah, who those nine uh, are. So we can do all the math on a wedge, but we can't count the number of noses in the room, apparently. <laughs> well, um, could could we sort of go around and talk about your specialties in the, in the group and let David uh, kibitz as much as he would like? Um, I'm a generalist, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's rotate. Let's, yeah. yeah. I, I came into to Bu9 kind, kind of through a, a side door. I had been a member of the Royal Manticore and Navy, the, the official Otto Harrington fan club. And what, one of the things that, that I just Smart like better. to do is I, I index stuff. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of a, a, just a, a natural talent for me. And I took the, the Honorverse and literally started writing, writing down the name of the ship, the page it was found on, and then I went back and created a database uh, where it referenced that 
what was described and if it was in more than one book, which book it was in and, and, and what was being described. And oops, it was a battle cruiser in that book and somehow it morphed into a super dreadnought in this book. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say that. No. Uh, he didn't tell me about it. it was... And, and I, I had, I, I had intended at some point when it was done to, I, I figured I would just put it up myself on the, uh, the, the internet. And this was before I even knew there was an Honorverse Wikia. Uh, and I sent it to the head of the, the Royal Manticore Navy, Martin Lessam, and I said, you know, this, you can use this as a resource. It's, it's something I did. And, and you know, it, it's, you're welcome to use it for, for people in, in the organization. And one of the people that he forwarded to was Tom Pope, and Tom said, <laughs> we need to, why don't you see if we can get Mark down to one of the honor cons? And, and we came down, and I'm sitting there among these geniuses <laughs> on physics and naval organizations and starship design, thinking, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I, I know some legal stuff because I'm a lawyer, but... Uh, and, and I happen to be good at indexing. Uh, it, it, as, as it happened, uh, it, it fit well with what the, the, the group needed at the time. And it turns out that everyone was kind of looking at everyone else going, um, what do we know about designing governments and, and legal systems? And uh, short, short, short story, uh, the, the next year, uh, I was extended uh, uh, the opportunity to, to join, and I jumped at it uh, with, with both feet. And uh, it, it's, it's been a great experience ever since, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's wonderful working with David and working with, with the entire group. Well, let, let me throw one thing out. Um, if this hasn't been explicitly said, it should be. For a writer, somebody who creates uh, a work of imagination, to have readers who are deeply involved in it is sort of a supreme compliment, okay? But it moves to another level of compliment when they become involved in working in that universe with him and become friends, all right? And that is exactly what happened with Bu9. Uh, these are all interesting people in their own right, okay? Now, we've had one or two rough spots along the road, yes, we have. Um, but these are people that Sharon and I regard as personal friends, and when they come down to, for, for, you know, our confab or whatever, you know, we look forward to sitting them down around the table and feeding them spaghetti um, uh, you know, it, that's just as important as then David disappears over to the hotel with them for nine and a half hours in a conference room while we talk about different aspects of how are the armored units in, in the uh, Andermani army organized and how do we do this and how do we do that. It has been an enormously rewarding experience for me. Um, to some extent, unless you're Eric Flint, writers need to be really careful about how much they invite people in to their to their universe. Eric is, in my experience, unique in his ability to integrate that many disparate writers into his yeah. commonly shared universe. He would be the dictator we would need if we had to have a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, having said that, the the ability to have a group of people with whom you can discuss what's going on not just where you have been but where you're going and what the implications of it are and you can serve as sounding boards for places you might want to go that is just of incalculable value to a series writer and that's exactly what i am um in terms of helping to maintain continuity and build continuity in gray areas of the of the the honorverse, and I think it sounds like it also it, it helps you maintain imagine the imaginative charge. A lot of series can go flat, but yep. this maybe is a 
Well, we do have we do have one problem. Speaking of Eric, <laughs> in, in, in the current book, which is that Eric pulled inadvertently and not without some assistance for me, without my thinking about it, he pulled certain critical events forward like 25, 30 years from where I expected them to be. And one of the results has been that the Solarians have had 25 or 30 years less time to get a clue uh, before the war between them and Manticore breaks out. And that means that the entire structure of the war has been different from the one that I had originally envisioned. He did this in uh, the Calder and a Ghost in that well, in that it, well, actually, he it started in from the Highlands, the first novella that he did for, first short story that he did for me, uh, because that's where the whole Mesa mm-hmm. manpower thing started to emerge into the light. By the time we got through Crown of Slaves, yeah. the first collaborative novel, that whole storyline had been had been pulled forward, and that's the only reason that Honor didn't die at the Battle of Mont- Manticore because that was supposed to be originally the climax of the first part of the storyline, and then twenty thirty years would elapse before the real villains of the piece emerged from the shadows. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have twenty or thirty years for the next generation to grow to handle. Well, I say unfortunately uh, depends on whether or not you think killing Honor Harrington would have been a good thing. Um, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, well, you know, well, I, did, I did that once. I mean, you know, I threw her off the Reichenbach Falls, but she came back. Um, but it's um, it's caused some reevaluation uh, along along the way, and these guys have helped with that too, because when we start talking about okay, what do we do now? You know, oops, kind of thing. They've been a really, really good sounding board for me to and. One of the really neat things about it is that they're confident enough talking to me about what they're doing, and I'm confident enough talking to them, that I've never had the feeling that the controls of the ship were slipping out of my my hands into theirs. And I don't think they've ever felt that David was just arbitrarily stepping on something that they had come up with because it didn't suit his prejudices about where he should be going in the universe. Yeah. That's a very valuable part of our working relationship. Yeah. We, we are not as a whole opposed to saying, David, we think that's the wrong idea. Yeah. Um, but we're also very aware of, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I mean, when, when you know, the, the term, because David said so, in the previous books, yeah. holds a lot of weight. And, and one of the things that makes Bu-9 so um, special to me is that the people we have are really good at finding ways to make it work. It's I can because, retcon that. Yeah, and, yeah, Andy's, <laughs> Andy's wonderful, wonderful phrase, I can retcon that. But that's really important because, again, we have this issue where we have to make it work. We have to say, I understand that the physics might not work. You might think this isn't going to work, but we've got 20 books that say it does. So we have to... We have to make something that is self-evidently true become true. And it, it, we have some really interesting conversations trying to make what's already been written true and then figure out what are the logical extensions from there. And, and we try to be as faithful to how we understand the real world works as we can in the process. Um, like you don't have a new form of energy of a form that's never been seen before, Captain as the explanation <laughs> as to why this particular thing works. Mm-hmm. And I think um, what David was just saying there about the Solarian League, I think that sort of emphasizes something about how he approaches it, both as a writer and as, as how we try to support him. Um, a lot of writers wouldn't have cared that logically things had been pulled forward 20 years into the future. He would, They wouldn't have cared that the Solarian League wasn't where he needed them to be for story purposes. They would have just either gone on with Plan A, either in the original timeline, or would, they would have just you know waved the wand and said, this is where the Solarian League is at. And realistically, David probably could have done that, because we hadn't really seen enough of the Solarian League to get a particular feel for exactly where they were. He could have fudged that, and he could have made that work. But instead, he he knew where they were, he knew what the timeline looked like, and so he sort of viewed this as a historian having to sort of explain how the history works and what the logical ramifications of that. He was, you know, in, in a lot of ways, David is doing alternate fictional history, if that mm-hmm. makes any sense. So and, he's Bunine's historian. 
<laughs> well, yeah, it, there's Saga there's a few of, <laughs> there's a few of us that have, that have had a little bit of a historical background too, and 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 the thing is, you know, David, that's the approach that David takes, and I don't recall anybody saying, well, David, why don't you just fudge it? Because that's not it the never, approach that we yeah. take either. Yeah. Um, well, you Paul Anderson, we have the same idea. Paul Anderson's novel, Midsummer Tempest. Okay, in which um, Shakespeare is the great historian and everything he ever wrote was literally true. So you have clocks at Troy and other stuff like that. Okay, that's kind of where we are a little bit here. <laughs> well, why don't we hear some other specialties? Of well, um, uh, this is Arius Kaufman. And uh, as I've been described before, a human terrain analyst, which... Uh, involves the political systems, the legal systems, and the economic systems. In fact, uh, Stephen Ryder and I have been having a lot of very good discussions uh, regarding uh, the economics of the universe. And one of the great things about BU9 is you get to interact with other professional intellectual people in their areas of expertise so thanks to Stephen, I've read books I would not have ever picked up uh, involving uh, economics of the future. And, and, and I think that that's one of the things that's great about BU9 is we also uh, really interact well with each other. The specialties aren't isolated from everybody else. You don't just have two people talking about ships. You have the entire group uh, talking about ships and, and uh, politics yeah. and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, so the political systems and social systems uh, are so broad. There's so many opportunities for developing the systems. When you read David's books, uh, he's got so many different uh, societies in the books that are wildly different from each other. Some of them sound very familiar. Some of them are sort of uh, uh, hybrids of, of uh, societies and cultures that we've experienced and um, so there's there's a lot to work with and a lot of uh, flexibility uh, to, to try to help design the, the universe. And uh, on the flip side there's also a lot of holes that we need to fill in and by that I mean um, David never sat down and gave us a complete governmental structure for any of the major powers. It's not like he said you know there's an executive and, the, and there's X number of people in the executive and they do this and there's a legislature and there's this number of people. You get bits and pieces of that. But when we sat down to actually start doing the companions, it was very important that we be as anal retentive as we can be. And they can be. <laughs> and we can be. I mean, what we were really looking for in those, in those political sections is the CIA World Factbook which has a basically a complete description of how the government works and how the legal system works in a country, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to put all that stuff together. We had, you know, we might have one author doing Manticore, another author doing Grayson, and then we had to make sure that we did an equally good job covering all the stuff. Uh, that was one of the things that was my responsibility for the for the first companion was to make sure that if we did ABC in, in the first one and ABD in the second one, that we needed to make those match. Um, it was really good having Arius and Mark on board uh, because I'm a, I'm a historian by my background. A historian and political scientist was where my undergraduate degree. And it's always, you need to have enough people that you can have a conversation about that sort of stuff. And we've got a couple of areas of specialty. We're better on the technical side, but we've got enough people who do the politics in the uh, government and we're branching into economics that we can have that conversation on on that side as well. Andy Presby, um, one time we were having a conversation, and um, he said something about something technical. And I said, well, you know, from a cultural side, there's this aspect of it. And he looked at me and he said, why do you always start talking about culture in these conversations? And I said, because you and Bill and Tom have the tech part locked down. I've got nothing, I, I, I can add no value on the tech side. I can add value when we start talking about command and control and when we start talking about the cultural implications of the Royal Manticore Navy and things like that. So we complement each other well. 
Every now and then we have to remind Mark that that's why he's here, because <laughs> because now Mark would Mark would want you to think that he's totally and completely non technical. He's a former B fifty two bombardier navigator, so I mean it's not like like he doesn't understand some of this stuff. Um, gravity makes things go down. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I mean it's a, it's a good group of people, and we we. We specifically select for skill sets that both we don't have but plug in well. Um, and personalities. And personalities. That's as, and, as important. Yeah, the biggest problem that we've had internally, and we haven't had very many big problems, but the biggest problems we've had have been personalities that did not plug in well. And we do everything we can. That's one of the reasons why we've gotten a lot more restrictive about how we bring new people on board because we've run into some problems with that. So like Stephen had a two year onboarding process <laughs> um, in part because we were trying to figure out how to bring new people on in a way that we could guarantee that they were a good fit. Yep. And so that's that's one of the important things about it. We don't want we don't want this. You know, the Royal Manticore and Navy has something like three thousand members. The Bu Nine will never have three thousand members. <laughs> it's it ceases being useful at that point. This is part one of a two part roundtable interview with David Weber and several top members of Bu Nine, the Honorverse Consulting Group. Part two of the discussion will appear next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Ooh, I want, Faith said, getting a good look at the saloon. Even with the maroon interior? Steve asked. The maroon I can handle, Faith said. It's the blue curtains that suck. Ooh, Steve said, stepping forward. I want. Nice helm, Faith said, looking at the enclosed helm, forward of the saloon. Who came up with this idea? I don't know, Steve said, examining the controls. We'll need to get it powered to check its fuel and water stores. You gonna be able to figure all this out? Faith asked. If I can't, your mom and sister can, Steve said. Now to find the way down. They quickly found a companionway, which was blocked by a hatch. Hello? He shouted, banging on the hatchway. Any zombies down there? I think I hear something, Faith said, taking out an earplug. Yeah, I hear something. Is that a zombie? Steve asked, cocking his head. I don't think so, Faith said, then cocked her own. Wait, I don't know. It's not on the other side of the hatch, Steve said. He readied his shotgun anyway, and then pulled at the hatch, which was stuck. I don't think this has a lock, he said. You've sort of got a master key, Faith pointed out. Yeah, Steve said. He pulled out his magazine, injected the round in the chamber, then pulled another round out of his vest, loaded it in the chamber, and reinserted the magazine. Where bouncer? Roger, Faith said, turning and ducking her head so any bounce back from the door would be taken on her body armor and helmet. Steve tapped the edge of the hatch until he found where something had been installed to make it lockable. He placed the barrel against the blockage and fired. The frangible round blew out the light latch, and the hatch opened on darkness. Zombies in the darkness, Faith said. That brings back memories. 
And whose idea was that? Steve asked. Uncle Tom's? Faith answered. I don't know why you keep blaming me. But I've never been to a concert, Da, Steve mimicked. You've got to let that go, Da, she said. We going or not? Let the, Steve said. Zombies come to you, Faith finished. You've covered that. They're not coming to us. Hello? Zombies? Hello? What's that? Steve asked, as a zombie came around the corner of the companionway. It was emaciated and could barely stumble along. Steve wasn't sure it was a zombie. Except for being naked, it could have been a nearly dead human. It stumbled on the stairs and started clawing upwards, snarling in a weird, dry tone. Jesus, Faith said, stepping forward. She'd drawn her forty-five and fired one round into the zombie's back, then another into its head. That was a mercy killing. There's still some sound, Steve said, and pulled out his earplugs. Hello? Zombies? Hello? Hello? I don't think that's a zombie, Faith said, stepping forward. White, Steve said. Just take our time. If that's a survivor, they'll keep ten minutes while we make sure we're safe. Roger, Faith said. I've got point, Steve said, stepping past her. He had to step on the zombie's body to get down the narrow companionway. The lower passageway was just as narrow and had a host of hatches. It also was covered in feces. Steve had wondered if he'd gotten his seals seated on the respirator. He knew now that he had. Otherwise, he'd be smelling all of this filth. One of the hatches, leading to a stateroom to port, was open. That floor was covered in feces as well. The sounds were emanating from a hatch forward, which was covered in scratches and badly battered. Steve tapped on him with the butt of his saiga. Hello? Hello? A weak female voice answered. Jesus, Faith said. Survivor. There goes this salvage, Steve said. Miss, we need you to just hang on. Water? Faith pulled off her assault pack and pulled out a bottle of water. I've got it, she said. Hey, passing through some water. You gotta open the door, though. Zombies? We're inoculated, Faith said and we've cleared all the ones in this area. You can open the door. You're safe. I mean, I'm a girl. You don't have to worry about me or anything. And the guy with me is my dad. There was a sound of a bolt being pulled and material being moved. Slowly, as if the person moving it could barely manage. Finally, it cracked open. Here, Faith said. She clearly was trying not to react. The girl was probably a little younger than Faith, but was emaciated and haggard. Faith opened up the water and started to hand it to her, then held it up for her to drink. Don't drink it too fast, Faith said. You'll just puke it back up. Thank you, the girl said, taking careful sips and treasuring them. Thank you. Sorry it took so long, Steve said. Emotionally, he'd known that there were going to be survivors on the boats. The law of the sea sort of mandated that they rescue people, which they'd been ignoring because, well, there wasn't anywhere to take them and there wasn't much law of the sea anymore. Seeing the survivor drove it home, though. Where's Charlie? The girl asked after a few sips. The infected, Steve said. We took care of him. Oh, the girl said. I sort of thought so. I heard the guns. Family? Faith asked. No, the girl said slowly. She seemed to be trying to remember how to speak. He was the captain. He put the bolts on and told me to lock myself in here after, after dad. She started to sob. Miss, we sort of need you to stay here until we're done clearing, Steve said. We'll get you over to our boat as soon as we can. But...
You want us to clear up some before you go through, okay? Okay, the girl said. Is there anybody else? How many on the boat? Faith asked. Four, the girl said. Me and mom and dad and Captain Charlie. Then no, Faith said. You're it. Okay, the girl said, tearing up again. Just hang in there, Faith said, handing her the bottle. Sip this, slowly. We will be back. Okay. Seven, a Y team, Steve said over the radio. A Y seven, everything okay? Nominal, Steve said. One survivor, female, early teen, non-infected. We'll clear before transporting. Okay, Stacy replied. We'll get ready for. Is it usable? Unknown at this time, Steve said. No power. Prep for engineering survey. So you want me to get ready to come over and see if I can get it running again? Stacy replied. Steve hung his head. Stacy was never, ever going to get military radio discipline. Yes, dear, Steve said. Then why didn't you just say so? Get the survivor back here and we'll talk. Steve and Faith checked the rest of the hatches. A series of homemade locks had been put on them, reinforcing the ones already there. They had to resort to a crowbar to get the master cabin door open. Nice, Faith said, waving her tack light around the cabin. I don't suppose I get this one? I'd say that the survivor will get the forward cabin again, Steve said. If she wants it, she might be tired of it. Your mom and I in this one. So Soph and I get the little beds again, Faith said, disgustedly. There are probably more cabins in a boat like this, Steve said. So at least you should have your own. There were a total of five cabins. The master and forward were both queen beds. The two smaller forward cabins had a double in the starboard cabin and bunks to port. The rear cabin had two bunk beds and a daybed couch, and there were no more zombies. I'll take this one, Faith said, when they found the last cabin. No zombie poop. We'll see, Steve said. Right now we need to get the remains gathered up and the survivor back to mile seven. Captain Charlie was fairly easy to move, despite the tight quarters. He hadn't been a big guy before starvation had gotten him. They took him up to the aft deck, tied some metal they'd found in the engine room to his ankle, and heaved him over the side. Despite his own starvation, the father was a bit more of an issue. Tight the legs, Steve said, getting his hands well locked over the corpse's armpits. Why are dead bodies so heavy? Faith asked, heaving the legs up to clear the railing. I'm not sure, Steve said but it's what they mean by dead weight. The father, like Charlie, disappeared into the depths with barely a splash. Okay, this one, Faith said, looking at the mother's gnawed and decomposed corpse. She turned her head away and retched slightly. Don't throw up in your respirator, Steve said. I'll get it. He got a plastic trash bag and gathered the mother's remains up there wasn't much he could do for the pile of goo that had been most of her intestines. And when he tried to gather it up, he found himself retching. They loaded the bag with more metal and made sure it sank. Dear God, we commend these people to the depths and the sure certainty that in the end of times, the sea will give up its dead. Amen, Steve said quickly. Amen, Faith said. I didn't know you were even a Christian, da. I knew Gran was Catholic, but... The girl's going to want to know that we did more than just pitch her parents over the rail of the boat, Steve said. Besides, keeping up the niceties to the extent you can isn't hard, and enough people think it's worth it that it's worth it. Taking 30 seconds to say a prayer sort of shows that we're still civilized or something. How's it going? Stacy called. The mile seven was tied up to the bigger boat with every fender and bolster they had alongside, to prevent them from banging together in the light swells. Steve started to shout through the mask, then keyed his radio. That's the last of the bodies, Steve said. We're bringing the survivor over now.
Okay, Stacy yelled, waving. Steve changed his gloves before opening the hatch to the cabin. Miss, he said, turning around and squatting down. Let's try piggyback. Will that work? With Faith's help, he got the girl back onto the mile seven and cast her off. What are you doing? Stacy asked. I want to take off my respirator, Steve said, and I don't want to do it alongside that boat, not until it's cleared out. Thank you for this, the girl said. I still haven't asked your name, miss, Steve said. Tina Black, the girl said. She was a tiny thing with black hair and blue eyes. Let's get you inside, Stacy said, wrapping her arm around the emaciated girl. Despite her condition, we need to decontaminate first, Steve said. Steve, Stacy said dangerously. We've got some water in the tank, Steve said, relenting. Use the freshwater shower. A shower, Tina said. Is that what you mean? I thought it was... I don't know what I thought. We need to get you cleaned up is what it means, Sophia said. I'm Sophia Smith, the second mate. That's my mom, Stacy. The guy who can't seem to use normal words is my da, Steve. And the hulking moron with a shoot-first attitude is Faith. Bite me, Soph, Faith said through her respirator. Don't mind her, Sophia said, wrapping her arm around Tina's shoulders. She's adopted. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a futures option on a thousand gold bars from a generation four star that's due to mature in only a few short eons. And the thanks and praise of a star kingdom delivered over all bands of the electronic spectrum, except Puce and Gamma Ray, to David Weber and View 9, the Honorverse Consulting Group. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. (laughs) 